Welcome to our latest exhibit, Wine Culture, where we take a look at the wine industry in Lake Country. We hope you enjoy this presentation and invite you to come and see the display in person at the Lake Country Museum and Archives. What's so special about Lake Country? Listing everything that's special about Lake Country would take quite a bit of time, but one thing Lake Country is known for is its wines. With at least seven thriving wineries in Lake Country, we know it's got to be good. But why is Lake Country such a good place to grow grapes for wine? 84% of BC's wine industry acreage is in the Okanagan Valley, which stretches 250 kilometres south to north. Even within the valley, the growing conditions vary considerably with daytime and nighttime temperatures, hours of daily sunshine and soil conditions varying given optimum conditions for different types of grapes throughout the valley. Surprisingly, the Okanagan Valley is warmer, more arid and receives more sunlight than the Napa Valley in California. Although daytime temperatures can reach 40 degrees C in the summer, nighttime temperatures are cool, which helps the grapes maintain their natural acidity, necessary for the fresh, bright, crisp wines the region produces so well. We'll look at some of the factors that make Lake Country a great place to grow grapes for wine. Firstly is the overall site and aspect. In the Northern Hemisphere, west and south facing slopes are typically the best sites to start with because these give you the most sunshine exposure in a day. Having some slope is also a great factor as long as there aren't any very low spots in the vineyard. Frost tends to settle low, so it's undesirable to have vineyards with frost pockets, especially since the fruiting zone is so low to the ground compared to most tree fruits. Any kind of proximity to a body of water, such as a lake, is also a bonus, as these can also help mitigate extreme temperatures in winter and summer. In winter, the heat rises off the lake and thus draws cooler air down from the vineyard, creating a bit of a circular airflow, so that warmer air helps in winter. In summer, as the heat rises up off the land, it draws the cooler air over the vines from the lake, again creating a bit of circular airflow and that cooler air helps in the summer. Direction of planting is a factor too. Ideally, rows would be planted in a north-south orientation so that there is even light passing over both sides of the vines as the sun moves from east to west but that is not always possible. Sight and aspect often dictates how the rows have to be planted. That being said, east facing slopes, those with fewer sunshine hours, can also work too, depending on what type of wine the winemaker wants to make. For example, cooler sites with shorter days and growing seasons can be wonderful if you want to make sparkling wines. These tend to be harvested early with more acid and less sugar due to the nature of how the sparkling wine is made, etc. So overall, many different sites can work for growing grapes for wines as long as the wine producer understands what quality of fruit that site can potentially grow and then the decision what styles of wines to make can be made. Soil is another consideration. Grapevines are also known to thrive in land that is nearly unsuitable for any other crop, so it is important to understand the soils. As Stephanie Stanley, winemaker at Peak Cellars, explains, heavy clay and vigorous soils are not ideal for growing quality grapes because there's often too much water and too much nutrition, although apples, etc., thrive in this sort of soil. Grape vines are best planted in well-drained soils like gravels, rock and sand, where more water and nutrition can be added as needed. But the vineyard caretakers are in control, not the soil. Grape vines will throw roots deep into the soils in search of their own water. Clay-like soils hold a lot of moisture and nutrition and can result in a very vigorous leaf canopy, which means more energy goes to the canopy and not the fruit. Long and thick shoots can also result in larger sized berries, which are swelled with water, and thus reduced intensity, concentration and flavour. This is why O'Rourke's Peak Cellars Cars Landing Road site is nearly perfect, with west or southwest facing slopes, mostly granite-based soils, fairly steep slope, 
and next to a large body of water. Climate in a particular area impacts the length of growing season the winery has. Varieties of grapes that can be grown are influenced by when typical bud bursts might be and when the first fall frosts might hit. In Lake Country, vineyards generally don't really plant anything that has a really early budder or late ripener, as they don't have the long growing seasons that they do further south, in places such as Oliver and Osoyoos, whose season could typically be up to three weeks longer than that in Lake Country. Also, some varieties are more winter hardy than others, so growers would want to take into consideration a typical winter season and how much primary bud damage could be incurred on sensitive varieties during a very cold winter. Cooler days and nights allow the grapes to retain more natural acids and allows for slower ripening, which allows the flavours, sugars and acids to ripen more evenly, which can be a challenge in the south. Southern fruit often ripens quickly with rapid sugar accumulation and acid decreases before flavours really start to come through which can result in having to add back a lot of acid to the juice and can result in high alcohol wines if all the sugars are fermented to dryness. Lake Country's northern climate lends itself to more naturally balanced ripening, but that is also a factor of selecting the right variety of the site. Good quality wine grapes cannot be grown just anywhere. Location and climate are two very important factors in growing grapes for making wine and these two go hand in hand. Not all parts of the Okanagan Valley are suitable for growing grapes and not all wine grapes will grow well in every wine making area of the valley. Temperature is very important in producing high quality grapes. A system called growing degree days is used to determine the suitability of a climate to produce good quality grapes. This system is a cumulative number formed from average daily temperatures throughout a growing season. The growing season starts in spring when the average daily temperature is above 10 degrees Celsius for five consecutive days and ends when there are no longer five consecutive days with an average daily temperature above 10 degrees Celsius. Growth is considered to start at 10 degrees Celsius so the temperature number above that counts towards the growing degrees days number. For example, if an average daily temperature one day was 25 degrees Celsius, the number for that day to be added to the season total is 15. This is 25 degrees minus the 10 degrees starting point equals 15. This number is calculated daily and daily numbers are all added together. There are four growing degree day classes based on the vinifera and French hybrid grapes grown in the Okanagan Valley. Generally, class 1 is furthest south and class 4 is furthest north. Lake Country is considered to be in class 3. If you were to look at the different degree day classes on a map of the Okanagan Valley, with each class given a different colour, you wouldn't see horizontal bands, but rather random areas of colour over the map because other factors affect the temperature. Surprisingly, Lake Country scores slightly higher than Penticton on the degree day chart. Here in Lake Country, Okanagan Lake has a large impact on the grape growing conditions as do the slopes that rise from the lake on which the grapes are grown. Water changes temperature more slowly than air, so the lake has a stabilising effect on the temperature of the air around it. The slopes also have an effect as can be seen in the diagram we are now showing. Let's take a look at how wine is made. There are five main stages in the process of making wine. These are harvest, crushing, fermentation, clarification, aging and bottling. Stephanie Stanley, O'Rourke's Peak Cellars winemaker, explained to me how they make wine. Many of the processes vary from winery to winery. 
Starting with harvest. This can be done mechanically where the grapes are shaken off their stems, but in Lake Country, grapes are usually harvested by hand in September and October. The timing of the harvest is very important and plays a part in the sweetness, acidity and flavour of the wine. As for deciding when to harvest, there are a lot of things to consider here as well. Wineries usually start with testing the grapes for sugar and acidity, as this will give a general indication of ripeness. They also taste the fruit, which involves several things. 1. Evaluating how juicy or pulpy the grape is. 2. Chewing the skins to determine how phenolic the skins may be, which is a check for bitterness. 3. They taste to see if there is any flavour development, or does it still just taste like sugar water? 4. They evaluate the health of the vine itself. Is the canopy still healthy, or are the leaves starting to yellow? And also the grapes. Are they starting to shrivel? Is there any disease risk? Are they too plump and fat? And finally, they consider the next few days of the weather after evaluating all of the other factors. The second step is crushing. Grape juice is extracted from the grapes by pressing. In the Middle Ages, the juice was extracted from the grapes by grape stumping. The grapes were trodden under bare feet to crush the grapes. Most wineries, O'Rourke's included, use machinery as a more efficient and hygienic method of extracting the juice today. O'Rourke's produce mostly white wines and use mainly whole cluster or whole bunch pressing for the white wines. The bunches of grapes, stems included, are tipped into a hopper which allows for some sorting as the bunches of grapes slide down onto the table and onto an elevator which lifts them up and drops them into the top of the press. The press itself is a large horizontal cylinder with slots in the bottom to allow the grape juice to drain out. An inflatable bladder inhabits the cylinder and is gradually inflated and deflated to gently squeeze the grapes and press the juice out. The grapes are tumbled periodically and squeezed again until the juice is extracted, leaving behind the seeds, skins and stems. Trays can be bolted onto the underside of the press to cover the drainage slots during pressing, to hold red skins during pressing to create the delicate colour in rosé wines. Red wines are subject to a few extra stages as explained by Stephanie. Before the grapes are pressed, the stems are mechanically removed. The bunches of grapes are tipped into a horizontal drum with a series of paddles that gently knock the grapes from the stems. The grapes fall through holes in the drum and are collected from underneath. Red wines are fermented with the skins before pressing. The grape juice from the press is then pumped into tanks for the next step, fermentation. Sometimes red wines are pressed with the stems as they are another source of tannin which helps bind and stabilise colour. Pinot grapes are generally a lower tannin variety of grape, so pressing with the stems aids in the colour formation. Looking now at fermentation. The fermentation process is where the yeast is added to convert the naturally occurring sugar of the grape into alcohol. The longer a wine is left to ferment, the more sugar gets converted to alcohol, resulting in a drier wine. Once all the sugar is consumed by the yeast, the yeast loses its food source and the fermentation process stops. If the winemaker chooses to stop fermentation, the wine is cooled enough to stop the yeast from converting sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide. The yeast is then removed. After fermentation, the next process is clarification or filtering. The grape juice that is pressed from the grapes can be cloudy and contain particles from the pressing process and these need to be removed before the wine is bottled and sold. Naturally occurring proteins in the wine can cause the wine to become hazy when it gets too warm, in the same way that the clear white of an egg turns opaque when it is heated, or tartaric acid binds with potassium in the wine 
to form crystals when the wine gets too cold. Neither scenario is harmful or affects the quality of the wine, but most winemakers prefer to remove both for the sake of aesthetics. During a heat stabilising process, a binding agent such as bentonite, which is a type of clay, gelatine and even egg whites, amongst many other substances, are added to the wine. O'Rourke's pig sellers use bentonite. Bentonite has a negative charge which attracts the positive charge of proteins which causes them to bind together and sink to the bottom of the tank or barrel. To cold stabilise the wine, the wine is cooled to a few degrees below freezing to make the crystals which can then be removed. Lastly, we have the ageing and bottling process. Finally, the wine is at a stage where it can be blended with other wines if necessary and aged or matured to produce its best flavours. Some wines are matured in oak barrels to give a slight smoky and smoother flavour, but most wines are matured in stainless steel vats. Once the winemaker is satisfied with the wine, it is bottled and ready to be sold. Grey Monk was founded by George and Trudy Heiss. George is originally from Austria and Trudy is originally from Germany, but they met at a hairdressing competition in Edmonton, Alberta. In the 1970s, George and Trudy made the decision to change careers and move out to the Okanagan Valley. When George and Trudy originally purchased the property that Grey Monk sits on, it was an orchard but they were not interested in growing orchard fruit, so they decided to remove the original fruit trees and to plant wine grapes instead. The original vineyard was planted in 1972, and the Heiss family originally grew grapes for commercial wineries, but later decided that they were not satisfied with what was being produced from their grapes. They then decided to try making their own wine from vinifera varietals. In 1976, the Heiss family imported Pinot Gris, Pinot Auxerrois, and Gewurztraminer rootstock from Alsace, France. In doing so, they were the first to plant the Pinot Gris vine in Canada. When deciding upon a name for their future winery, it was only natural to incorporate a nod to its future claim to fame, as well as George's family history. In Austria and Hungary, this grape is called Grau Munch hence the translation to grey monk. The grape has a very distinctive blue-grey coloured berry. After allowing a few years for the vines to begin producing, grey monk opened its doors in 1982 and soon developed a favourable reputation, particularly for its fruit-forward white wines. The first vintage was produced out of a garage on the property and consisted of 125 cases. Since the first vintage, production has increased to over 100,000 cases per year. George and Trudy's son, George Jr., decided to enrol in an enology, which is the study of wine, and viticulture program in Germany. After four years of studies, George Jr. arrived back in Canada in 1984, just in time to help with the harvest and to take on his new role as winemaker. Eventually, all three of George and Trudy's sons held their own role within the winery's operation. After 35 years of proprietorship, which saw growth within the winery, and the opening of the restaurant in 2002, George and Trudy made a difficult decision to retire from the wine industry. Grey Monk was thus acquired by Andrew Peller Limited in 2017. <coughs> Andrew Peller has continued to build upon the work of the Heiss family by producing award-winning wines that are renowned for their quality as well as their amazing value. Intrigue Wines on Goldie Road is a collaboration between the Wong and Davis families and sits on the site of the former Rainbow Ranch orchards. Previously a home winemaker, Roger Wong joined Tinhorn Creek Vineyards in 1995 at the time of the winery's launch. Here he learned all the necessary skills from farming, 
right up to judging wines for competition. Roger moved to Pinot Reach Cellars, now Tantalus Vineyards, as winemaker in 1998. In 2005, Roger joined Grey Monk Estate Winery, which is where he met Jerry Davis, Grey Monk's controller. Roger's wife Gillian works as Intrigue's sales coordinator. Jerry Davis has worked in the wine industry since 1998 and spent 14 years with Grey Monk as their controller. Together with her husband Ross, Jerry farms 10.5 acres of vineyards in Lake Country. This property yields around 4.5 to 5 tonnes of grapes each year and each tonne of grapes yields around 600 litres of wine. Intrigue's grapes are grown in several locations. Jerry and Ross Davis grow grapes for Pinot Gris, Kerner and Riesling at the winery, while Gillian and Roger Wong grow Riesling and Muscat Canelli grapes on their seven and a half acre farm in Oyama. Both of these vineyards were first planted in 2008 and yielded their first harvests in 2010. Riesling, Pinot Gris, Rothberger, Ehrenfelser, Kerner and Gewurztraminer are also grown at a few locations in Oyama. Intrigue's only Chardonnay grapes are grown in Kelowna along with Gewurztraminer grapes. The bottle of Intrigue's bubbly blush wine called I Do was designed by renowned Lake Country artist Margaret Kyle. Edmonton Construction Company founder Dennis O'Rourke split his time between the Okanagan and Edmonton when he bought property in Carr's Landing in 1979. Dennis purchased a piece of land called Rainbow Gardens which was part of the former Rainbow Ranch on Goldie Road in 2011 with the idea of starting a small family winery with son Tom and daughter-in-law Lisa. This is the site of the now O'Rourke Peak Cellars and Garden Bistro. Dennis continued purchasing land, most of which was in Cars Landing, until he owned almost 300 acres, most of which was undeveloped pine forest and much of which had been affected by mountain pine beetle. Vine planting began in 2013, resulting in the first harvest in 2015. These grapes were made into wine in an old apple shack at the Cars Landing Vineyard under the name The Chase Wines. As the yields were increasing and more vines would begin maturing, the grapes were going to need a larger winery to call home. In the spring of 2016, winery construction began at the Goldie Road site and the first wines were made at the new winery, now Peak Cellars, in September 2016. The Tasting Room and Garden Bistro was opened the following July. In the spring of 2019, the Chase Wines was rebranded to O'Rourke's Peak Cellars. O'Rourke's now has just over 103 acres under vine between the two vineyard sites. This is around 4 acres at Peak Cellars and nearly 100 acres on Cards Landing Road. Roughly half of the vineyard is dedicated to Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, with the other half planted to Pinot Gris, Gewurztraminer, Riesling, Gruner Veltliner and Gamay Noir, with each varietal and clonal mix carefully selected to match the soil properties. Construction of caves at the Cars Landing site began in 2015 with drilling and blasting right into the bedrock and was completed in 2018 with a final length of 330 metres that bend and wind and have several different entrances and exits along the way. A tasting room and the Garden Bistro was opened at the Goldie Road site in 2017 and the property boasts a half acre garden and two massive greenhouses that provide most of the produce for the bistro, providing fresh supply for about 80% of the year and the remaining 20% of the year uses the carefully preserved and stored goods. Blind Tiger Vineyards has a most interesting story behind its name. During the days of American Prohibition in the 1900s, when sale and consumption of alcohol was illegal, establishments opened up where one could buy and consume alcohol. Commonly known as speakeasies, they were also known as blind pigs, 
as a taunt to the police, and blind tigers, with blind tigers being regarded as slightly classier establishments. These places generally had a statue of a tiger at the entrance. If the tiger was blindfolded, it was safe to enter. If it was not wearing a blindfold, then it was assumed the place was being watched. The site of the Blind Tiger Vineyards was once an alpaca farm. In 2010, the Wildchuck family planted their first blocks of Riesling and Gavut Tremina vines before adding Pinot Noir and Chardonnay at a later date. In 2013, the winery received organic certification from the North Okanagan Organic Association. The fertiliser used is 100% plant-based, which allows optimal soil nutrient profiles and natural minerals are used to control fungus on the grapes. They are organically raised heritage chickens minimise pests. The Blind Tiger team believes that organic farming is not only beneficial to the land, but it also produces better quality wines with more complex flavours. Blind Tiger officially opened its doors in 2015 and is popular for its live music events and wood fire pizza, as well as the 11 types of wine they offer. Blind Tiger now produces around 35,000 bottles of wine a year. <laughs>